Good morning. So today, uh, what are we talking about? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Sassy here. Is anyone there? Hi, my name is Sassy. I'm based in Berlin and I want to welcome you to Sisi, the podcast where you see what others see. In this, our first season, we're talking about colors. I want to welcome my fantastic co host Petra van Phelen, sitting by my side here in Berlin. Good morning, Petra. Hi, Sissy. Ready for our interview today. Tell me, do you know why for some people green would be the color of envy? Or why do we feel blue or see red? Well, colors have different meanings in different cultures. And our guest today is able to give us quite an insight on that. He is a journalist and author, best known for his sports and political writing. He was born in London on April 29th in 1960 and grew up mainly in Cape Town. After studying abroad for one year at Southwest Texas State University, he returned to South Africa and got deeply involved in anti-apartheid activities from the late 70s till early 90s. Meanwhile, he completed a BA with honors in economic history at the University of Cape Town and received a BA of law at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, where he later completed a PhD in political studies. In 1994, he also earned a Master of Arts. He has been working as a journalist since 1984. In South Africa, he wrote for the South African Rand Daily Mail and other South African newspapers. Later, he worked as a foreign correspondent for a Rome-based global news agency, IPS. He then returned to London in 1993, and since then, he has been working as a freelance journalist. His articles have been published by various newspapers, including The Observer, The Daily Mirror, The Financial Times, The New York Times, The Internationalist, BBC History Magazine, The Telegraph, and Die Zeit, among others. He also broadcasts regularly for the BBC World Service. Over the past 15 years, he has lectured in critical thinking and journalism, as well as media law and media theory at Birkbeck University of London. He is author of several books, including the very well-received memoir, Dancing Shoes is Dead, Kings of the Ring, The History of Heavyweight Boxing, Black Brain, White Brain, Is Intelligence Skin Deep, Map Readers and Multitaskers, Man, Women, Nature, Nurture, The Story of Color, An Exploration of Hidden Messages of the Spectrum, and his most recent book, Skin Deep, Dispelling the Signs of Race. He has a special fascination for boxing and sports, and when not working, he trains for marathons and other races. We are very thankful we got a spot in his full agenda and have the opportunity to talk with him today. We are more than pleased to welcome Dr. Gavin Evans. Good morning in London, and thank you very much for being this uh, morning with us. Uh, Good morning to you too. Dr. Evans, uh, what a colorful biography and life you have experienced. Law, economy, sport, art, South Africa, London, Texas. So many landscapes, diversity, exposure to different cultures and therefore confrontation with different realities. Your work, research, articles and books, besides of being well and rightly written, unveil a man of courage, humbleness and deep emotional intelligence. What made you become an explorer of human nature? Um, Let's call it a searcher of the human soul, true colors. I think um, that part of it was growing up under apartheid in South Africa. You know, I mean, as a a white South African in those days, you you could go one of two ways. And most whites um, supported apartheid and and, and, or, or at least did nothing to oppose it. But there was a significant minority who vigorously opposed it in one way or another. Now, at that time, um, black and brown people there didn't have the vote. Um, And the state became increasingly violent, increasingly oppressive. So opposing them meant a combination of underground, semi-legal and legal strategies and, very crucially, international sanctions. And 
Eventually, um, the combination of those sanctions and mass resistance brought apartheid to an end. So I was involved um, in the underground um, for a decade and in various ways was exposed very directly to the brutality of apartheid and of, of state repression. And in, in that time, I came um, not just to oppose racism, which is how, how it started, but, but to, to really hate it. Um, and also because of my experiences, um, both in, 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 in politics, but also in journalism, I was exposed to other racial class and, and religious um, structures along the way. Um, and uh, that too influenced my value. So even though I've lived in um, in London for the past almost 30 years, um, in a way, I think I've continued my interest set in those kind of fraught years of the 19, late 1970s, 1980s. Uh, and I mean, it's the reason why I write a lot about race. Um, I've written a lot about gender. Now, at the moment, I'm writing a book on, re on religion. So, so those kind of early interests have persisted in a way. Apart from all the qualities already mentioned by Ceci, you seem to be an utterly curious person, um, which one must be as a journalist, I assume. And um, in your career, you have researched about so many different topics. Where did your, did your fascination come from to write a book like The Story of Color? And how long did it take you to create this fantastic educational piece of insight and knowledge? <laughs> well, well, you know, I'd, I'd love to be able to say that I came up with the idea, but um, that wouldn't be strictly true. Um, the, the, the truth is that a publisher, the publisher of, of the book, Michael Amara Press, they handpicked me for the job based on some of my previous writing on the color pink. And I think they grabbed onto that and they thought, okay, this is the person to write their book. Anyway, I immediately got completely immersed in it. I mean, I, at school, I'd done art history and um, and so on. And I was actually working in an artist's um, uh, studio at the time. So I, I just became completely immersed with the project, both in writing the book, but I, I also was, they asked me to help with the illustrations. So I, I was the one who suggested the illustrations, which was a great deal of fun because I'd never done that kind of thing before. Um, the, in terms of the time it took, it was quite a quick turnover. Um, I, I did most of my um, research very intensely, working about kind of 12 hours a day during the three months of my university holidays um, when I wasn't lecturing. Um, and I, I guess it, so, so it took about six months, but I was really drawing on knowledge accumulated over, over the years, um, at least for the material for some of the sections. So it's hard to put a, a, a definitive time on it. Dr. Evans, you were talking about the, up, the upper height. At first hand, um, white would perhaps be described as a color of pureness and innocence. But we know that through history, this color has been loaded with divisive and dangerous ideology. This color grew to become a utopia and was placed in the center of European culture, symbolizing beauty, health, cleanness, tidiness, self-control, good manners, and even good taste. We find this in the arts with a powerful influence in aesthetics by characters like Winkelmann's idealization of antiquity, Watchwood's pottery, Whistler's white cube in art galleries, Le Corbusier purist architecture and paint, and so on. Um, in politics uh, with Benito Mussolini, Hitler, Franco, and their dreams of rebuilding their metropolis in oppressive whiteness, white became a tool to divide, exclude, and oppress. And equally, as in the arts and politics, mainstream science a century ago could of course not fail to do its part by constructing the myth of genetics, race, and IQ regarding white brain supremacy. Dr. Evans, you stand against this with two books with which you debunked society's lingering attachment to race science. One of them being Black Brain, White Brain is Intelligent Skin Deep, and your most recent one, Skipped Deep, Dispelling the Science of Race. Could you please give us um, some insight to this um, subject? Yeah. Um, so those two books, in, in um, slightly different ways, they picked apart the premises of what is known as race science, which is not really science at all. So I, 
I mean, to very briefly, I show in those books that modern humanity, the, the, the contemporary human brain, has not evolved for at least the last 100,000 years, but probably for much longer than that, because anthropological studies and archaeological studies push that ever further back, the idea of, of, of the emergence of modern human intelligence. So, I mean, I do show in the book that there are genetic differences between populations in terms of certain things like disease patterns, skin color, nose shape, and so on. But those are not significant, and I explain why, in terms of brain and particularly in terms of intelligence, which involves networks of thousands of genes acting in combination. So that's part of it. I, I mean, I also show that differences between the IQ scores of populations are entirely the result of environmental or cultural influences. They are not due to differences in average genetics. And I go on to show that why um, average IQ scores within populations rise or sometimes fall, but usually rise over time when they when people when a population is exposed to education and prosperity. I mean, the whole book looks at racist science, race science, and it just really both of those books pick it apart in different ways and show why it's wrong. What was for you a, a real eye opener, um, a, a revelation, or maybe even touching during your research for both of these books? Black Brain, White Brain, Is Intelligence Skin Deep? And your recent book, Skin Deep, Dispelling the, the Signs of Race, which you could share with, with us. The reason I wrote those books is because I was noticing a revival of race science. Now, I mean, much of that was take, taking place on the web in a kind of subterranean way with kind of right-wing platforms or anarchic platforms like 4chan, 8chan, but I was seeing it on YouTube, I was seeing it in all sorts of places. And it started, it was starting to emerge in establishment circles, particularly in the realm of psychology and what is known as evolutionary psychology. So you've got people who are very well known, like Steven Pinker, um, arguing um, that, that it was good science to say that, for example, um, Ashkenazi Jewish people, my father was an Ashkenazi Jew, by the way, um, we're innately more intelligent than anybody else. And I, I looked at that and I looked at the arguments for that and I, I, I devoted a whole chapter to that showing why that is actually wrong, why Steven Pinker is, is profoundly wrong on that. So I started to see that it, it emerging in that form and I felt that, that one needed to take on the science of it and needed to, to take it by the throat and show, and show why it's wrong to, to counter that. And, and fortunately, at, at the same time, I was doing that to various other people. Angela Saini is somebody I work quite closely with. She wrote a, um, a book from a different angle on on um, on race science. So, so there's been there's been a, we, we, those of us who who are arguing against people within, particularly the realm of psychology, who are not scientists, who are kind of arguing for a kind of cat's paw version of race science. And and it was very important to to counter that and and show why it is wrong. And, and 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 I mean another part of it was is, is it just brought me back to to what I'd grown up with in apartheid South Africa, where the apartheid government was saying exactly the same kind of thing that there were innate differences between populations. Um, you know, um, uh, white people were more intelligent, and mixed race people had an inclination towards alcoholism, and you know, um, black people were, were 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 kind of musical and good at sport, but um, uh, not good at logic, and you know, it was, it was just a version of that. I was I was starting to see that kind of thing um, emerging again, and I felt it needed to be counted. Very interesting. You were talking about Ping Ving, the uh, introduction to research or book of the story of color. So let us focus now on pink and feminism. Um, in this journey to decoding culture and the attempt to understand human nature, you also understood what fatherhood really means and you were able to discover your nurturing instinct despite uh, being a man, you became a feminist. Now, we know that feminism focuses mainly in the advancement of women, but you, Dr. Evans, have exposed a broader perspective, one where men have also a lot to gain from. What would you say to those thinking feminism is a strictly pink or a women's issue? Well, I, do, I think that feminism is mainly a women's issue because for hundreds of years, for millennia, 
um, and, and even today, different forms of, of uh, patriarchy have persisted. But I do think that men can be feminists too, and I do think that men can benefit from feminism. Um, I mean, one example, I, I actually did a TED talk on feminism and fatherhood, and I tried to show um, that if men put their minds and their hearts to it, they can be just as good at nurturing as, as women, and, and they should be putting their, their, their minds and their hearts um, to it when they become fathers. But, but society kind of mitigates against that. Um, uh, so the old assumption that the man must be the part of familias, the breadwinner in the family, and the woman must be the homemaker, I think it's a terrible idea. It was always a terrible idea. Um, and aside from that, it no longer fits the reality of the modern economy, where more women go to university than men, um, and where people have babies older. And, and I think smart governments have, have clocked onto this and have introduced very generous forms of parental leave for fathers as, as well as mothers. I have to say that Britain is lagging behind um, uh, in that regard. So that's just one area where I think that, that um, feminism can benefit fathers. It, it, it releases, it can release men from um, the restrictions of, of old style machismo. And those are just cultural constructs as is masculinity more generally and, and, fem and femininity. We agree, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in relation to that, um, speaking about uh, the cultural way of thinking, in our Western culture, we are biased with gender and colors. Pink, for example, is for baby girls and blue for baby boys. When and how did colors become associated with gender? Well, um, I mean, well, let's take that example, uh, pink and blue. So... Uh, over the past uh, 60, 70 years or so, we, we've come to assume that pink is a girl's color and blue is a boy's color. Um, so much so that um, there were some very silly evolutionary psychologists from the University of Newcastle a few years ago um, who decided on the basis of their students' preferences that, that um, pink preferences for, for girls and blue preferences for boys were biologically innate. Um, I mean, even though both their male and their female students in their, in their test on this um, cited blue as their favorite color. Um, but the reality um, is that it has nothing to do with biology and everything to do with culture. So, in fact, um, pink for girls is a relatively recent tradition. Um, I, when I was researching the book, I found all sorts of references to this. So in 1897, for example, the New York Times ran a story, Baby's First Wardrobe. And they advised the pink is usually considered the color for a boy and blue for a girl. Or to take just another random example, I found many. Um, in 1914, the American Sunday Sentinel, um, a publication I don't think exists anymore, instructed mothers to use pink for a boy and blue for a girl if you're a follower of convention. And just to give you one more, um, in 1918, the British Ladies Home Journal noted the, the, the generally accepted rule is pink for a boy and blue for girls. The reason is that, uh, that pink is the more decided and stronger color and is suitable for a boy, while blue is more delicate and dainty and is prettier for a girl. They're probably thinking of light blue. Um, I mean, so it was only in the 1950s, um, and it followed a very vigorous advertising campaign in the United States um, aimed at women that pink was steered more or less exclusively in the direction of girls and women. And, and from then on, it became um, a very much predominantly female color. But it's, it's, it's only since the 19, 1950s that, that that had locked in. It was starting to develop in about, from about the mid-1930s. And then by the 50s, it kind of solidifies. So it's very, it was very, it's very much a cultural thing. And, and with each color, these things are, are quite specific. Dr. Evans, um, through this research regarding color, which is splendidly condensed in your book, The Story of Color, um, you became aware that among all the colors that the human eye can see, we're only capable of identifying those colors to which we have given a name. So semantics and language do play a fantastic role in our visual cognitive capacity. Would you mind helping us better understand this, perhaps by giving us some examples? Yes. Um, I mean, I think, I think lang language um, uh, affects the way we, we, we think more generally. But, but yes, certainly as far as color. 
Um, I mean, when we, I think when we name something, it takes on a distinct identity in our minds. So, if, for example, I mean, just to go back to what I was saying about pink and, and blue, well, we have two color names for shades of red in our languages, red and pink, and we see them as distinct colors. Um, but we have one name for shades of blue. So we see both light blue and dark blue as variants of the same color. Um, I, I believe I don't speak Russian, but I've, I'm, I'm told that Russians have different names for light and dark blue and see them as distinct colors. So it can vary from culture to culture. I mean, another example I think would relate of language would, would relate to the connotations of different colors, which vary hugely culturally. We're talking about white. So, you know, white as this idea of a color of purity, but it's also a color in many cultures of death. Um, black is the color of, um, in many cultures of death, other cultures of mourning, but it's also color of sexiness, the little black dress kind of thing. So if you think of red, we see that as a kind of a hot, aggressive color because it's associated with fire and with blood. Fire is actually really orange. And green is a cool color because we associate it with trees and grass. So the associations of colors and whether we see them as hot or cold or whatever also relates to that. I think that how we identify colors in our minds, the associations and just the names we give them is, is very important for our color perception. I had guests that uh, relate red with spiciness and others uh, made them think of blood and others love and the womb and so on. We have also talked about the connotations of the color white and We also talk about gender connotations, blue and pink, and so on. Um, how do you change perception of colors? What happens uh, with colors? Or better said, what does it take to change the social, economic, historical, and perhaps even religious? Now that you were talking about your new um, book in religions, significance of a certain color over time. Well, in most cases, I'll perceptions of the connotations of color, they kind of get passed on from generation to generation, but they can change quite quickly. So as I showed with pink, um, you know, they, they can change um, in a matter of a generation or two. I mean, another example of that is purple, which was once a royal color. And in fact, back in the ancient world, no one else could wear it, sometimes on pain of death. Um, and, and the main reason for that was its scarcity. Because um, it was e extracted from the Murex um, sea snail, which is rare. So, um, and, and it, you could only get tiny bits out. It also was very stinky. Um, but then in um, uh, 1856, an 18-year-old chemistry student, he, he was actually trying to find a malaria cure. And he was using the aniline from coal. And he discovered that when he mixed the, the coal aniline and chromic acid, Um, the result, uh, when he dipped a white cloth into it, was purple, a, a very bright shade of, of, of purple. He actually called it mauve, um, or mauvini, he called it. Um, and, and the next discovery he made was that it didn't um, run or fade, um, as other dyes had. Um, and so he patented it, and it made him an absolute fortune. And it instantly, um, in the matter of a few years, became the color of fashionable Victorian women. Um, and then in the 1960s, it had another big change because it became the color of flower power and of, of the alternative culture um, and of the hippie movement. Um, and then later, it, it's shifted again. It's become um, a kind of predominantly feminine color. Um, and it's seen as a kind of, um, in, in fashion circles, as, as a kind of alternative to you know, a feminine alternative to pink. Um, so colors can change quite quickly as a result, like in the, um, of, of technological change with, with the Movine purple thing, um, or sudden cultural changes, or as it with pink, with, when, when the advertising industry decides, okay, we're going to go on a pink campaign and we're going to focus it on women. And that, and that had the effect of changing it. So sometimes, The, the, these ancient perceptions can change very quickly. Dr. Evans, in addition to this, um, in your book of color, you describe some examples of development of the names of color categories, colors, and use, which apparently can differ significantly per culture or region or even time. 
Um, a question to that. It sounds quite simple, but I think it's not so easy to answer. Is where are the names of colors derived from? Can you give one or two examples of that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, the one I could think of there um, was orange. So the word is a relatively recent addition to language, and and several languages still don't have a word for it. the The word itself has its uh, goes back much further. So it, it, its origins are actually in the ancient um, Dravidian language, um, but that has nothing to do with, um, with a color. It means fragrant. Um, and later in Sanskrit, it was linked to the fruit, or at least to the orange tree, and then it spread. So you had naranga in Sanskrit, um, naranja um, uh, in India, narang in Farsi, naranj in Arab, um, naranya in, in, in Spanish. Um, and, and so in English, the word orange is, a, is kind of a, a corruption of, of this trend. Because traders mistook the ranga for an aranga, and this evolved to an orange. It was only in the 16th century, which is when oranges arrived in England, that it morphed with the color. Um, before that, just by the way, um, the word in, Eng um, in English, so old Eng in old, older English or Middle English, was um, gilu iad, which means yellow red. Um, I'm not sure if I've pronounced that correctly, but, <laughs> but uh, um, so it had a different word. And then, and then the, so the, the origins of the word orange come from the Dravidian language, but it has a, a strange root. I mean, um, uh, pink actually is another example of, of that. So in most European countries, it was called a variant of rose or rosa. Um, the word pink originally meant um, a, a kind of, yellow lightened with chalk, unless you were into fox hunting, in which case it would suggest the deepest red. Whereas, you know, what uh, people would talk about, about donning one's pinks, if they still do. Um, and the pinks are very dark, bright red. But it was also a term that described a kind of frilled edge. You know, those scissors that cut zigzags, they called pinking shears. And it was via that path that the name, the color pink emerged. Because the pale red dianthus or, or carnation flowers were known as pinks because of the notches in their petals. So they looked like they'd been trimmed with pinking shears. So it was through that kind of very circuitous route that in the, I think it was the late um, 17th, early 18th century, the word pink became associated with pale red and became its own color. Those are two examples I could think of. Without, they had a kind of clear, even if... Yeah, yeah. very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah I love all these facts. We, the totally other question. At some point, colors got commercial relevance in the retail, fashion and design industry. And every season, new trendy colors are launched in the fashion and design collections. And every year, a Pantone color of the year is released. And the U's get more exotic names over the years. Could you give us a little insight on the history of this commercial use of color development and the psychological effect on customers? Yeah, um, so, so I mean, the, the example I used earlier of, of the advertising campaign around pink, um, there, there was the, um, uh, is a body in the United States, which, which gets together every year, I think it's called the Color Council, and they, they, they discuss what colors are going to be the, the kind of fashionable colors of the year. In the 1960s, the um, purple emerging as, as the, the kind of color of rebellion, they, um, it, it, it was adopted by the color council. And then there was this explosion in kind of granny vest shirts in purple and various purple things. It was, so, so what they do is they pick up little trends that they, they find in society. And then, and then um, uh, the earlier example in the 1950s of the advertising campaigns around pink was another example um, um, of that. So we think that the colors of fashion are, are something that merges organically. And in some respects, they do, because those involved in setting the fashions, the color councils, they look at little trends that are happening. But there's also a measure of decision making. There's something deliberate about it as well. Does, for example, availability would be also an element to that? Availability, in, in terms of the way colors emerge, availability um, has always been 
um, a measure of that. But that's less of an issue now be um, because of synthetic colors. Okay. Um, so back in the day when you had to, before you could, you had synthetic colors. And I mean, the, the, the very earliest example was that example I used of Movin, um, purple. Um, but before that, colors had to come either from things like um, the Murex snail in the case of purple, but most dyes were vegetable dyes. And the availability of the colors, the more rare they were, the more they tended to be aristocratic colors. So for a very, very long time, until in fact, in most countries, until around the beginning of early 17th century, there were colors that were restricted because the rarer colors, the ones that were less available, were restricted for various levels of the aristocracy. And ordinary people just kind of wore russet browns and a few other kind of um, earthy colors, and that's all they were allowed to do. But once you get synthetic dyes coming in, then basically all colors become available to people, and that has been less of an issue. I mean, it's no more difficult to make purple nowadays than it is to make black or white or red or blue or yellow or green. So, so that's less of a question now. Um, yeah, talking into the subject, we're going to talk about uh, Goethe versus Newton. So Isaac Newton was able to grasp and then scatter white light with a prism. And in a way, the idea of God's wholeness was broken into seven visible colors. He established the rainbow and was able to mathematically prove it, laying the path for others to experiment and reproduce color in a scientific way manner, as you were mentioning now with uh, clothing. For the rays to speak properly have no color. In them, there is nothing else than a certain poser and disposition stir up a sensation of this color or that, he wrote. This had very serious religious connotations. Now, a century on, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, in this, his theory of color, opposed this, as he called it, an absurd idea. Goethe, a philosopher and nature lover and exposed to art his whole life, thought of colors from a divine perspective. White color was bound with truth, metaphorically speaking, of course, and through different examples, he made all efforts to prove Aristoteles' 2,000-year-old color theory was correct. This dispute between Goethe against Newton was a feud of poetry against physics. In a certain way, both were right, because Newton and so did Goethe had different perspectives when defying the same problem. Probably this perception of Newton breaking with the past and going beyond was the most difficult challenge. From your perspective, Dr. Evans, where does color exist? Is it an illusion or is it what we see or what we think we see? Yeah, well, in a way, the Goethe and Newton thing homes in on the difference between color as perceived in light and the colors in the paint box. So, <laughs> I mean, if, if, you, if, you, um, if you put all the colors together um, in, a, in, a, in a light spectrum, they go to white, um, which is what, what Newton um, uh, said. But if you mix all the colors together in the paint box, they get to a kind of dirty bra. <laughs> So, I mean, look, Newton got a lot of things wrong, and um, he certainly wasn't a very nice person, um, but he was right on the color spectrum with regard to light. Um, just, just a little bit of background. I mean, he, he was confined to his rooms. Um, it was a bit like COVID um, because it was during the Great Plague. Um, so he kind of got busy, and he used a partition board, and he put a pin, pinhole in it, um, and then he used a glass prism. And in this way... Um, He observed what you were talking about, how light could be broken up into the colors of the rainbow. Um, and um, he showed that white light is the combination of the full color spectrum. So um, in, in, he wrote a book about it. It was called Optics. It was published in 1704. Um, and he explained how these colors comprise light rays that, uh, rays that they kind of bend or refract at different angles when passing through a prism. So the colors then separate. Um, and the ray that bends them the most, by the way, is violet, because um, it's got the shortest wavelength. And, and the color that bends the least is red with the longest wavelength. Anyway, but, I mean, that's not so important for this. But because um, crucially, what he did was he reversed the experiment too, showing that the spectrum could be reassembled 
into white light. Now, as you were saying, if Goethe, he wrote the theory of color, um, and he described um, Newton's idea that white light is the combination of all the colors, as you said, as an absurdity. And he complained about people parroting um, mm -hmm. Newton's ideas um, in, as he called it, in opposition to the evidence of their senses. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess you could say maybe what, what Goethe failed to grasp is the difference between the colors in the paint box um, and those of light. I mean, as I, you know, you, you mix the, um, the artist's palette together, you're not going to get a, um, you just get a sludge. Um, but when you're considering it light, it all changes. Spin the color wheel fast enough and it will appear white. I don't know how terrifying it would be to just, you know, bring the abstraction into something tangible and just play with it. Imag I, I mean, that should have been a very, uh, very, very strong threshold at that time. Yes, I mean, it was. Newton was, he was a very odd man. I mean, he, he spent a decade of his life trying to, 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 to turn lead into gold. Um, he was obsessed with the Holy Trinity. He became the head of um, the mint um, in, in London and, and um, uh, was very vigorous about hanging counterfeiters. And he had these furious exchanges with people who were slightly critical, who had different views of him. He was a nasty piece of work, but he had a knack of discovering things. And one of those um, related to the nature um, of, of light um, and, and the relation between color and light. Um, and, and, and he did get that one right. As well as other things. Yeah, of course. <laughs> gravity, for yeah. example. The law of gravity. This has gravity, been... Gravity, yeah. And so on. And, and calculus. Yeah. Yeah. This has been a very insightful interview. But before we finish, if you allow us, we would like to close this program with a fun dynamic. Petra will mention a color to which you will try to answer with the first thing it comes to your mind. It is not a race, nor a marathon race. So please take your time. Ready? Okay. Blue. Sky. Violet. Flower. Green. Tree. Red. Blood. Black. Funeral. Gold. Money. <laughs> Yellow. Sun. Magenta. Printing. <laughs> <laughs> Orange. Fruit. And last but not least, white. Shirt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I've just, I've just, and I only said that because I've just ironed one. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Perfect. Very good. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> so great. <laughs> This was so much fun. Thank you very much, Dr. Evans, to have had you with us today has been a real treat. Um, we th oh, thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. We, we thank you for the time and for an outstanding interview. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Thank you, Ceci. Thank you. Please be sure to check the episode's description to find out more about Dr. Gavin Evans' publications and projects. Thank you, Petra. And thanks to our listeners, wherever you are, for having allowed us to share time with you. We will see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>